Hey folks, it's uh, Julian of the Lafayette Trail. I hope you're doing well. Today I'm off to South Carolina. What I think is particularly interesting about South Carolina is that this is here that Lafayette first set foot when he came to America in 1777. This is here that he really set in motion what his heart committed him to do, to support and eventually achieve American independence. So Lafayette has a lot of attachment with South Carolina. And in March of 1825, he gets to return here to the state where it all started for him. And that's what I want to talk to you about today, the visit in March of 1825. So today you and I, we're going to follow segments of his journey across the Palmito State, especially his entrance into South Carolina. We'll go to Chirol, we'll go to Camden, and we'll go to Columbia, the state capital. We'll see how Lafayette tried to advance a form of American nationalism while expressing a condemnation of slavery in a way that didn't add further stress on the American institutions that were already weakened by the divisiveness of the 1824 presidential election. So these are our questions for today. We've got some answers to figure out. So let us waste no time. Let us hit the trail. Let's follow the Frenchman. We made it to Chirol. I'm actually walking toward the house where Lafayette spent the night of March the 6th into the 7th, 1825. That was, Chiro was the first town that Lafayette visited when he entered South Carolina. So I wanna introduce you to a couple of my friends, Bill and Susan, they actually own the house where Lafayette spent the night. And Bill is actually related to the governor that took over in 1825, Richard Manning. So we'll see what they have in store. We'll see what they have to show us. So come with me. Let's go take a look. Bill, there are many figures in early American history you could potentially be interested in. Why are you interested in Lafayette? Well, because he visited here in 1825 in Tura, and uh, they had a ball here in his honor. And uh, we, this is one of the many Lafayette houses that you'll find up and down the eastern seaboard. But uh... The governor of South Carolina, when Lafayette returned in March of 1825, was Richard Manning. So you're related to Governor Manning, he was one of your ancestors. What is the feeling that it, it gives you that your ancestor honored Lafayette as governor of South Carolina when he was here in March of 1825? Well, it's with a great deal of pride that uh, you know, it's come down through our family. I was going through my grandmother's uh, belongings, which she was uh, Margaret Adger Manning, and found the uh, picture of the silver case that uh, Governor Manning had given to Lafayette when he came to South Carolina. And uh, just the, the family has embraced Lafayette and that relationship with Richard I. Manning for many, many generations now. The third was also governor of South Carolina. Okay. So we have three the governors. Uh, this, it's uh, just so powerful for our community that Lafayette came here. And uh, just uh, every time you talk about Oh, where do you live? And I said, well, we live in the Lafayette house. And they go, oh, that is just the most beautiful place. And it was just so amazing that Lafayette came to Chiral. So it's, you know, it's been 200 years almost, but uh, it's still like it was yesterday to people, so. When he came to Camden in March of 1825, he laid the cornerstone of a monument to his friend, Baron de Cobb. De Cobb was uh, a German-born individual that served with the French originally 
In the late 1760s and early 1770s, he was sent to North America secretly to assess the situation before the American Revolution broke out. Um, he went back to France and then he sailed with Lafayette in 1777. They were very close. Behind you, there is a monument to Baron de Cab. As a member of the Presbyterian Church here, what does it mean to you that Lafayette came here? It's hard just to express what he was thinking. I don't know what he was thinking, but Cab was a, a highly trained soldier. He was not an American. He was not paid to come fight in this war. Uh, to have someone who thought enough of enough to come to a different country to to help people uh, fight for their liberty is very meaningful. And I think when Lafayette came here, he understood, of course, perfectly that that's where his friend Baron de Cobb had died during the Battle of Camden in 1780. And I think it was a way for Lafayette to show how patriots, his friends, people like him that supported the American Revolution, even if they were not Americans, came here to this country, fought for the Americans, with the Americans, and died here in some cases, like the Cobb. Lafayette was here in Colombia on March the 10th. He stayed two days. He left on March the 12th. So he was conducted to Gervais Street to the house of a gentleman by the name of Isaac Randolph. I want to show you the, um, the house, the famous house of Isaac Randolph where Lafayette spent a few nights here in Colombia. Right. It has changed a little bit, yeah. But everything, you know, changes over time anyway. So here, just take a look. Tell me what you think. Pretty parking lot, huh? I just want to say, these clothes up there, they don't look good. <laughs> Behind me, you see the mother in South Carolina State House. So, March the 10th, 1825, Lafayette was uh, addressed by the governor of South Carolina, Richard Manning, at the older version of the State House near here. Let's go take a look at the original site of the State House over there. I think the rain stopped, I'm not kidding. Oh, yeah, here it is. Do you see the boulder right there? So, that's the original site of the State House that Lafayette would have been received inside of, where he was addressed by Governor Manning, where the state banquet took place, and the ball on March 11th before he left. It's all along Gervais Street, within a few blocks from each other. So there are a couple things that took place in Colombia that I think are of particular significance. The first one is that when he was here, the governor gave him a map of the state which is a, a rare move that only a few states have done and it's documented for a few. I'll give you two examples. So one is South Carolina here and another one is New Hampshire. Both states gave a map of their state to Lafayette. And to me, there's another very important moment that takes place here. Uh, it took place on March the 11th. It's a meeting that took place between Lafayette and a slave by the name of Pompey. Pompey was one of the very first Americans that Lafayette ever met here on this continent after he first arrived in South Carolina in 1777. And there were orders at the time during Lafayette's tour in southern cities like Charleston and Savannah that enslaved people be kept away from the ceremonies organized in honor of Lafayette. But Pompey pushed through. He wanted to see Lafayette. And he got inside the same room and Lafayette noticed him, acknowledged him, and they spent time together. So as the nation's guest, Lafayette was able to acknowledge Pompey and spend some time with him. They even had a glass of champagne together. But to me, this anecdote is very significant because it shows how Lafayette was seen by the enslaved people in America at the time as a 
a vessel of hope in which the hopes for achieving one day the abolition of slavery and equality could be achieved. And Lafayette was that conduit for so many in America. So Lafayette left Columbia after a ball that was prepared for him on the 11th at night. The next morning, he left Columbia headed toward Charleston. South Carolina demonstrated how Americans revisited their geography to express a burgeoning nationalism. Americans knew how to survey their land. They knew how to make maps, and they knew how to project the land of the free on paper. By giving Lafayette the ability to ride his own trail across the Palmetto State, South Carolina sought to sublimate its own geography and elevate itself above the rest of the country. Lafayette's visit in March of 1825 is also highly indicative of a social fabric undermined by slavery. I think his visit also shows the two competing functions that Lafayette had to fulfill. One, to uphold the Republican foundations of the United States in the tradition of national unity initiated by George Washington. And two, to advocate for an improvement of the condition of the slaves. Ultimately, Lafayette was operating in a national framework created by the Founding Fathers and the priorities that were theirs during the Constitutional Convention to preserve the Union at all costs, even if that meant to compromise on slavery. I think he fulfilled his first function every step of the way virtually during the tour, including here in South Carolina. On the other hand, the numerous appeals that he was trying to make for progressive measures on slavery remained largely ignored by the political leadership of the time. That's it for us today in South Carolina. Thank you for following the Frenchman to the Palmito State. I'll see you on the trail very soon. Thank you for watching. A bientôt.